mansions or sects of Rastafari. Now they call them mansions because, as Christ says in the scriptures, in my Father's house are many mansions. So these different branches of the movement, um, I, I focused on two in particular in my research. One is the Nyabingi order, and uh, again, you see the emphasis on repatriation here. And the Nyabingi order is, uh, you know, the, the oldest, um, and uh, some people have said it's the largest. Um, sorry, is that would that be accurate? Okay, that would be the largest, at least you know in Jamaica, I would say. So. Um, the other, I interviewed a few people from the Ethiopia Africa Black International Congress as well, um, typically known as the Bobo Shanti. So again, you have, look at their name, Ethiopia Africa Black, real emphasis on this African identity of black as a skin color. And in the background, you can see Haile Selassie, a picture next to Prince Emmanuel Charles Edwards, who is also seen to be a black Christ. And uh, the, the idea that God came to earth as a black man uh, really influences their, their black identity. So but what both of these mansions have in common is Nyabingi music. And this is their sacred expression. It's also referred to as the Bantu order. And they, they really uh, attach a, a certain mystical, spiritual, sacred value to the drums themselves, as well as the sounds that they make. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well in a bit and, and uh, in depth in the video I'll be showing later. Um, the drums are the bass, which you see on top of the big ones, the funde, and the smaller ones are the kete drums. So these three drums have a lot of significance and are used in worship music in both the Bobo Shanti and the Naya Bingi order. Another, uh, unfortunately, brief oversimplification of things, the evolution of, of Naya Bingi and reggae music. Okay, so there's African drumming traditions like Kamina and Buru on the left here. I put them in colors to uh, make them stand out as kind of the, the religious traditions, right? Um, so what the Rastafari did in the 1950s and maybe even a little bit before that is to really seek out a, a uniquely African music that would express their identity and their faith in a way that was true to the Buru and, and Kamina traditions that were passed down but was still uniquely theirs. Now when Rastafari first started out, it was growing up black churches who were singing the same hymns and the same, uh, the same songs and everything that, that the white churches were singing. However, they started replacing terms like Jesus with Rastafari. And Naya Bingi music evolved. Now, in Jamaican popular culture, you have Mento, Ska, a whole evolution of popular music that came down to Rocksteady, and then other American music like big band jazz R&B that, that blended with these as well. And eventually what happened was reggae was born from this popular music being influenced by the Naya Bingi 1-2 sound. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the video. But um, just, just to give you an idea here, here is Bonnie Whaler, the Bob Marlin Whalers. And you can see him performing with, um, thanks for this picture by the way, Dr. I mean, the, uh, the Naya Bingi drums backing him up. Now in Bob Marley, uh, when he would perform, his I-3s, the backup singers, for example, are, are wearing some of the traditional <coughs> Rastafari, what you would see the, the women wearing, headdresses, and, and he would have the same percussion along with him. And it's hard to see, but in the background you have a backdrop with uh, the Lion of Judah and Haile Selassie there. So again, really giving um, the, the focus of his performance to the Rastafari faith, to their African identity. And so reggae really, really promotes this, this Rastafari consciousness. Now, so if you understand reggae in terms of its roots in Rastafari and its connection to the black liberation struggle in, in the, throughout the 20th century, would you expect to hear reggae from these white boys right here? <laughs> I, keep wishing I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, it's just not what you know. Everything I've told you so far, it's not. It's not that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trump's like this shirt and all that. Like, not the same shirt. Well, so <laughs> it's not the same shirt. So what I what I really want to understand is how did the Rastafari feel when people like this, who aren't really connected to the culture all that much, 
are identifying with the music, imitating it, really attempting to make an authentic reggae sound, there's still some kind of cultural, ethnic, maybe color disconnect here. So this is where my research comes in. But before I can do that, I want to define a few terms for you, just give you a little bit of uh, an explanation, especially for the video later. Some things might be confusing to you. Ja, I already explained, it's, it's the word for God. Um, I and I. If you listen to Bob Marley, listen Bob Marley, fans in here, maybe, okay. Um, <laughs> never, right. I, all right, so I is an important idea in a massive philosophy. The I in I is the same I that is in I. <laughs> Okay, so I and I is we. I and I is us. I and I is all those people. You know, you, you might call it the image of God if, if uh, we have any Buddhists in the room. It's your Buddha seed. Or, your, you know, the idea that there's this essence that all of humanity shares. It's the same I in all of us. And you'll hear that a lot. Now, um, I also takes the place of syllables at the beginning of certain words. So spirit, for example, you just drop the SP becomes hybrid. So instead of spiritual, hybridical. We'll also take negative elements out of words like understand. You're not underneath it, you overstand it. You've, you've conquered that, you're on top. Um, and one thing you'll hear a lot throughout also is Babylon. Historically, Babylon was the oppressive empire um, where I believe Iraq is located today. And Babylon in the Bible becomes a type that is uh, refers to the Roman Empire. Today, for the Rastafari, it is it is evil and oppression all around the world. This this sort of embodiment of of uh, just bad behavior, no de deviation from what what the king would expect. So Babylon is the enemy of Zion and its people, being the Rastafari. So. This, this sort of creativity with language also happens in the music, um, but that just is a really brief overview of, of some of the terms that we'll come across here. Now, there's a lot of diversity in the responses I got. People feel differently about um, whether or not Rasas own the music or whether or not white people are free to play it. But one thing that everyone had in common that I spoke with was that this feeling that the music came out of the Rastafari and of the black people, that's that's where it generated from. And it's passed down. Like Bongo Trevor here says, music comes as a heredity. You don't, you don't even necessarily learn it. Sometimes it's just naturally born within you. Um, and this picture here is a great reflection of, of how you're just brought up in this environment with the drums being very sacred. And I'm not sure if it's the same child that I saw playing the repeater drum, but Mark, honestly, he's better than you. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, really good, even at like three or four years old already. So, now, ideas of this origin or emergence of the music from the black people are expressed slightly differently. So, I'm just going to give you four examples. We black build the music, which is the title of my thesis. Um, the creators, all right. So, so building or creating. There's there's this conscious effort of. Uh, like a cultural construction that's going on here. But it also ties into some, some comments that I heard from people in terms of black supremacy. And I don't have time to really explain all the different views on black supremacy that I heard, but this idea that the black man came first, all of the good in civilization historically was built by black people. Even the things that we have in, in the US here, our, our economy thrives so well because we had black slaves building it for us, right? Um, the creators, if Ja is a black man, then all black men are also creators. Um, and all Rastafari, I think, can participate in creation, and that's why the creativity and language is so important. Um, then we have terms like it grow out of the culture, right? Like it's an organic sort of natural evolution. Bread is, I see as kind of a combination of, of both ideas. You intentionally breed, but it's also, again, an organic growth. So seeing that it, it 
originated in the Rastafari community and the struggle and in black culture, there are uh, a variety of views on ownership, and it might make sense that, well, it was made by us, so it's for us, it belongs to us. This is Banco Chefon, who took me everywhere I needed to go during my stay in Jamaica. And he, um, he said this, this music belongs to us. He went on to say, that doesn't mean you can't play it. Music translated 500 times throughout this course of my stay. And I really wanted to drive that point home, was that, you know, music is, is the exception to the rule in a lot of ways. We have these cultural lines that are drawn, but music goes past that. And that wasn't necessarily uh, the case for everyone that I spoke to, but, you know, first of all, some of my questions to, uh, the answers to my question, does the music belong to black people? Does it belong to the Rastafari? I think the music is for Rasta. The one who said this, it was in the context of, you know, it's about our struggle. So it's by us, and therefore it's for us. Someone else said, I and I need that, not the white race. Okay, so the, the black people are going through the struggle in Jamaica historically. They're the ones who need the music. It belongs to them because they need it. White people don't need it. Yet he had also a problem with white people playing it. Now, I asked this one Bobo priest, to what extent does reggae belong to black people? And he says, to a great extent, because it's mostly a reflection of the struggles of the black people. And then he went on to say that it gets a little complicated. I can't say it belongs to us 100% because there are mixed people out there. And you know, you have black mothers with white fathers. So it makes it complicated and, and you know, everyone has their own struggle, but to a great extent, it still belongs to us. So there's a, a degree, a continuum where there's a sense of ownership. And this next comment here, you might see a contradiction in these uh, two statements here. First on top, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that music belongs to us. It belongs to anyone who's universal, right? And then again, you have an attitude. It belongs to us, culturally, yes. The interesting thing about these two statements that seem to contradict each other is that they were said by the same woman within five minutes of each other. <laughs> now, we talked about this a lot about contradictions earlier, and it seems like a problem, but when you put it in context, I asked her, does music belong to black people or to the rest of our eye? No. Then we get talking about Garveyism, um, miscegenation, the, the idea that we're okay to, to intermingle in some ways, but um, black men shouldn't marry white women and vice versa. And then this line is drawn. And then she says, no, it definitely belongs to us. And the issue of, of property rights came up as well. So there's, there's a lot of complexities here. I don't have time to explain them all, but um, you know, it, it's a very conflicting and tough topic for some people to answer because to say that something belongs to you and your culture, you need to start to take into account like where is the line drawn, right? Um, okay, so maybe it's a black thing, but Bob Marley, half white, right? I mean, so what, is, what does that mean? That presents a little problem for some people. Um, great picture of this part. Okay. Um, so does ownership imply exclusivity. No. For, for everyone I talked to who said that black uh, Rastafari own reggae or black people own reggae, they still have no problem with white people doing it. Um, but there are some conditions to playing it. Okay? First of all, you have to be doing it out of positivity, out of love. You have to, to be doing it with respect, not making fun. Um, so there's a concern about what is their intention in doing this? Why do these white people doing something that came from us, right? What are, what are they after here? Um, there's also the condition that you need to be conscious of yourself. Rastafari talks a lot about consciousness, about you know being uh, enlightened, open-minded, or you know a lot of these these happy terms that we throw around a lot. But for them, um, you know, really look inside the eye and know yourself, and then. That's what you're creating. You're, you're creating something, so you better really know what it's all about. Now, there are some optimistic reactions as well, right? Um, when white people or other nations play this music that came from us, 
it makes it look like, you know, we're out there. We're important now. Um, and it also is a way for other people to relate to the Rastafari struggle by <coughs> expressing the similar struggle in their own environment. Now, back to the uh, issue of intent here, right? Our, our motivations for doing it. Is it all about money? Um, and they don't really mean it. Or is he growing dreadlocks because he just thinks they look awesome? The Johnny's dreadlocks are awesome. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just tell me. Um, I'll let you touch on them later. If you <laughs> um, so, so like this uh, one teacher that I spoke with, she said, um, you know, we see white people do this, and it's, it's nice, but you know, is, is it just something they're putting on? What is, what is their intention for doing this? Does it mean anything to them? And uh, just a quick story here. You'll see a lot of pictures, I'll show some in the video too, where we're posing like this, making the sign um, represents trinity, unity, what you would say unity rather, not unity, but unity. Um, it's also similar to a heart shape, and you see how Selassie is posing like this a lot in his pictures. So I went to do that with one Rasta when we were taking a picture, and he pulled back his hand, and he says, what does that mean? So I explained to him, and he said, all right, I just want to make sure you know what it means before you're doing it. So the, the consciousness of what the symbol represents is an important criteria for having permission, so to speak, to participate in the, in the ritual or in the music. And you just have to be very natural, as my friend Ross Ayenton says. Sometimes we're just very suspicious about when people are trying, trying to come in and you know, maybe infiltrate uh, what we're doing, trying to understand us, why are they trying to understand us? You know, and to put this in, in a context so you can appreciate it, Rastas have been, not, not always had the easiest time with the Jamaican police, right? I mean, ganja farms being raided and, and uh, you know, they've been chased out of their homes. They've had their dreadlocks cut in prisons in the past, right? And why are you laughing? <laughs> yeah. um, should make a girl over there. She's nuts. Uh, now, so historically, right, it's been a struggle. So to be suspicious is understandable. And that's why authenticity is a concern here, too, right? Is it authentic if we haven't gone through that same struggle? Um, Russ Shorty says to me, you know, we come through that pressure, so we have an impression of it more than the way, and we have those feelings, right? So it's not, it's not as authentic when you sing it. It's not as real. You're not, you're not doing it with the same feelings. There's also a concern that, you know, like you can, you can appreciate this part of our culture, but can you really participate in the rest of the struggle? Can you take on like the responsibility and the, and the persecution that we often go through? Um, or are you just gonna sing about it? Um, and again, if you haven't been through it, you, it's not as authentic when you sing about it. There's also the concern about the image, right? Like I said in the beginning, you look at us and coming from a white man, we're singing this, this message about Rastafari or something similar, um, you know, it's not really this effective. And it's, this, this man says to me, you know, why are you, why are you singing up to us about this message? We already know it, it came from us. Go tell it to your people, you know? So white people should have a white audience, maybe, it, that's what he's trying to communicate. But at the same time, um, he's accepting and he's very, very welcoming and, and uh, understanding why I would want to play reggae music. Now this man says, um, when the black man come in and see the eye, I mean me, up on stage, you know what the black man see? He sees what he remembers from this persecution, right? His mother being whipped and beaten. And that's, that's a problem. I mean, again, the, the persecution, the struggle. Yet he goes on to say, that's how we used to feel at one time, because we were bald head meeting, non ras or not righteous. And he wouldn't feel like that now because Rastafari and its ideals have helped him reach this level of consciousness where he doesn't care about color. So again, the movement is trying to trying to move past this issue of color in a lot of ways. Yet there's still like a, a very recent history that makes it 
difficult to do so. One man says the big grouse of the Rasta is that white people are out there making money off of it. And not only that, but you know, if the original people aren't getting anything, then the people who are listening to it aren't also getting the same authentic music that they're supposed to get. So both people are getting ripped off in the end. And Rasta's living in poverty. While all these people around the world are making money, and the place, the people where the music came from, still suffering. So in, some, in the views of some, there should be a sort of reimbursement to people, not just to the musicians in the Rastafari movement, but the herbalists, other people who contribute to the culture. Because, I mean, think about herb and reggae. People, people really associate those two a lot, um, you know, for obvious reasons. But, you know, these people who have really helped to build this culture and, and this mass appeal around the world, other people are profiting from it. All these people are still doing their thing in Jamaica and not getting the respect and the financial help that they feel they should get from it. And this also brought up a few people issue of intellectual property rights, right? We think about this in terms of I read a song, I should get the credit, you know, some royalties if you, you get it. But for some people this should apply to a culture as well. If something grew out of, of a people, a group of people, they should get financial credit and other people are profiting off of it. And again, he's using the terms founder or the owner of the music. So if the black people are the owners of the music of the Rastafari, own it and created it, they're the ones who should get the credit. And lastly, this made me feel good because even though this statement implies that, yeah, there should be something given back, what this Brother Ross Ayanton said to me is that my contributing by writing music, expressing myself and expressing love and respect for their culture is atonement enough in his opinion. It's that I'm part of the contribution of all being together and all coming together. Being there in the presence of the Rastafari, not not in any scrutinizing way, but in a way that I really want to understand what they're all about and make my music, therefore, more genuine is, is uh, you know, atonement enough for him and it's compensation enough for him. Then he goes on to say, is my God given right to live this way? And I hope so, because I can't help it. <laughs> well, you know, maybe a few million dollars I can fix it, but I don't know. Um, you know, and to speak the things I'm speaking, pursue the things that I'm pursuing. So my identity is my identity, and he still respects that. So all that to say, I was shown a lot of love and respect from the brethren here, the, the symbol here, right? Um, and for me, what I took away from, from all of this was that there, there is this diversity of opinion, and there's nobody right there demanding oh, well, you should give me some money because you're making money off of the product of our culture. You know, some people would say it'd be really nice if you could get back. But music, again, transcends all boundaries. And even though it belongs to the Rastafari, it belongs to the black people, in the opinion of most of them, it's okay. And in a lot of cases, it's a blessing that we're doing it. So I'll take this time to... Um, hear a couple questions from my, uh, my panel up here in the front. And if we have any time before I need to show the video, which is about 10 minutes from now, um, I'll take a few more questions from the audience as well. So, who's going first? Um, the first chapter of your thesis is called Forward. And this is for a reason, because you want to not only use this convention as something that often appears near the beginning of a, a book, it's often called a forward, but, but you want to pick up on the theme of uh, progress and, and moving forward. So now that you're almost done with a, a major uh, research project on this, um, do you feel that your thesis contributes to this forward uh, motion uh, of this, this social movement? Um, how and how not? And um, where do you 
see um, the Rastafarian movement going to next? What's forward next? Okay. The first part of your question is how is my thesis contributing to the progress of the Rastafarian movement? Or how do I see it possibly doing that? Um, I would hope that when I send copies of it down to Jamaica, to the new friends I've made down there, or in whatever way it's distributed, that Rastafari would read this and think, wow, like people are paying attention to us, and that, that means something. This person has taken the time to write us pages. <laughs> um, <laughs> just um, and, and not just that, but the content. And I start out by saying in that forward that we need to get past these, these racial lines. And they've been constructed in such a way that people use them in very negative ways. And what the Rastafari I'm trying to do is to take that black-white line and really create something positive for themselves. Some seem to be in a position where, you know, we, we can move past this, uh, we, we can accept people like this ginger uh, coming to the tabernacle and, and observing us and asking us questions and bringing us cameras and weird technology and stuff in here. But, um, so I, I think in that sense, I, I would hope that this collaboration, because it is a collaboration, it's the co-authorship of this thesis with the people that I talked to, that they would, one, feel better about themselves and their identity, take a little more pride, and that they would also see the collaboration with people of other races, other nationalities, other skin color, can really be something positive and enjoyable in the end. And where do I see the movement going? I have no idea how to answer that question. I mean, it's, it's so unpredictable. If you look at the, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the first 100 years or so of, of Christianity and how in some ways the movement of the Rastafari have, has sort of paralleled that. Um, and they haven't had any big ecumenical councils yet to really define what what the Rastafari all have to believe. Uh, there's only a few main tenets of the faith, the, the divinity of Pilate Selassie, the idea of Africa being Zion, and the uh, use of God as a sacramental um, Eucharist. Now, even these things have slightly different interpretations. So I think that in the next, uh, yeah, I would hope that in the next 100 years or so, um, there's more of this collaboration, not just with Rastafari and non-Rastafari, but between the Naivingi order, Bo Shanti, and 12 tribes that are in the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Copy Zion Church, which is um, another nation. Now, I, I would, I've heard while I was down there a lot of talk of collaboration, mutual respect, and coming together and doing, doing things together, being one movement. I would, I would uh, be glad to see that, not because I, you know, agree with everything they stand for or anything like that, but but just because I think that they've done a lot of great things for them, for themselves, for Jamaica, for the, for the world, and that they could continue to show that love and community by uniting more. So, that answer your question. Chris. Well, Ben, uh, as someone who's done this kind of work for a while now, uh, first of all, I want to commend you for doing something that you cannot simply do with your intellect. You are here in this picture in the backstage of Rastafari. And we might think of reggae as the front stage. So you have to do that. To be there, you did that not just with your intellect, you did it with your heart. So I commend you for that. But my question here is, you touch on issues of intention, the intention of you, know, you playing music, but one of the things I'm, I want to press you on, what are the different intentions behind Rastafari playing Nyabingi music and Rastafari playing reggae music? Did you begin to get at these? And what can you say about the context in which these are performed and why they're performed? Are there crossovers? Are they separate? Uh, there may be a clue 
to why you should be able to or should not be able to perform this music in terms of Nyabengi in that issue of why Rastafari do it. So I'm wondering on that. Well, first of all, historically, drums in the African community um, from the days of slavery were uh, a symbol of resistance in a lot of ways. Uh, so for, for white people to sit down and play the drums, um, still a lot of times it won't happen in the, in the tabernacles. I was told that some people really still have an issue with that. I didn't meet anybody who, who treated me that way. However, that, that seems to be the case um, with both Bobashani and the Night of Order. And the, the difference is, um, and we'll talk about this more in the video as well, um, Night of Bingy music is a sacred music, and it's, it's, uh, it's a way for the Rastafari to come and, and sit down with these drums and to connect with the universe, and to connect with their ancestors in Africa, to connect with their brethren around the world. Um, now, I didn't get to go to one of the big Holy Day Bingies. I just went to two Sabbath Bingies, and they, um, they were very welcoming to me because I came with Baba Chef on. It was nice to be there. And I still wouldn't, wouldn't have even tried to sit down and play the drums. However, um, I, don't, I don't know what his feelings on that would be. Now, the difference between their views on that thingy and reggae, I think, are, are because reggae, like I said, blends with this popular music. And it, it came from something that was already partly secular and then was used by the Rastafari to get their message out there. So, Reggae, in a sense, is, is a tool for spreading the message, whereas Naya Bingi is an insider activity. And my, my best guess as to why the, the uh, reggae music, the views on reggae music are a little closer <coughs> is that it, it's seen as already something that, that people have participated in. And that's why Bob Marley being the first international reggae superstar uh, and being half white may have may have some significance there as well because there's there's this idea that it's it's a way of participating with the outside the group. Naya Bingi again is almost strictly a way to to identify ourselves as um, speaking in their terms, identifying ourselves as black people in a struggle and uh, wanting to be repatriated to Africa. Uh, and that's something that even even though they may have no problem with me playing Naya Bingi music, it would still be more of a, an infiltration into their, into what, what is theirs. That answers the question. You're all around. That's, yeah, okay. You, you know, that's the next trip. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, you know, I, I do, I want to go back there. Um, Penn State wants to, you know, find a couple more thousand dollars. <laughs> 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 uh, but now I'm going to be so we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll go back down there, and I would like to really get into the Bingy music and um, some of the, the different ways that the Bingy rhythm is played. Next up. Well, I'm sorry, Ben, but I want to push you a little more on that question. Sure. And ask if you I'm, I'm still really interested in your, your the points of your thesis where you really pick up on those points of um, contradictory discourses and Dr. Honiak's point about those the differences between the sacred and the secular in the music and that space right where that difference comes in maybe between what we own what we may not own quite so much and I think I'm asking you to, to make some connections between those moments of cultural contradiction in, in the discourse and maybe that space between the sacred and the secular. Okay. Um, well, first of all, this is it, there's again a, a continuum of, of, of you know some people uh, it, it seems have uh, ascribed a, a sacred significance value to 
reggae music almost as much as they would the night of music. Now, what they played in the tabernacle, I don't know. But they still regard it as the music of the king, um, in the words of one priest I spoke with. Um, however, I think where the line is drawn um, has a lot to do with something we, we talked about before. The, the space, sacred space, right? And traditionally, um, in a lot of reggae songs, uh, you hear things about, um, you know, your body is your, your own temple, or um, there's, there's no temple built by man, uh, a couple of examples. So the idea that in rejecting the Western view of, of religion, you're tearing down those walls, and you are the one where God is at, right? So what I saw, though, was, was different. Once you enter the tabernacle, you're, you know your hat comes off, and you're in a sacred space, and that's where the music is sacred, right? And women, for example, are not allowed to play drums in this particular tabernacle, and as far as I know, in other tabernacles as well. So, outside of the tabernacle, completely fine. Um, and. I don't, I don't see that as a contradiction. I see it, again, as a moment of context. And the, the, the example I gave on the slide where, yes, it belongs to black people. Well, no, now that we're talking about cultural alliance. Um, no, I'm sorry, the other way around. It belongs to black people now. But no, music is universal. So I think the contradiction comes down to where you are and who you're with. If you're with your brethren, music is sacred. If you're playing a drum by yourself, which you'll see in the video, it can still be sacred, yes, but are you okay with me videotaping it now? Yes, that's fine. Um, I could videotape while they were drumming inside the tabernacle. So if I understood your question correctly, um, I, I, I can't answer because I didn't hear so many of these contradictions in my interviews pertaining to the, the, the music. I did hear um, one in particular about reparations, where um, I'm going to get a little sidetracked here, but priest Dermot Fagan um, talking about reparations. Well, how can I hold you, a white man, accountable for something that your ancestors did? I would never say that I need, I need some kind of reimbursement or apology for you. He goes on to say later, the white race, we're just waiting for them to say, you know, wow, we can't believe what we've done to you. And now you owe us something. Um, you know, so so I don't, I'm not gonna pretend to really understand these, these contradictions so much. Um, but just to say that, uh, that that's room for, for future research and discourse about um, why, why is this statement being made in this particular context? And, not really and I think that for music, um, you know, I, I think when reggae is something that you, you use to, to enjoy or to have a good time, it's one thing and it's okay, but it's not sacred. If you're using reggae music like certain artists do, um, and we'll talk a little bit about these in the video as well, uh, like Luciano, Morgan Heritage, uh, Bob Marley used to do the light, and has, has just had this uh, sacred expression going on on stage. Then it says, okay, you know, maybe maybe there is room for, for some sacred values to this popular music as well. So, yeah. I would say, um, <clears throat> I really commend you for the way in which you're dealing with contradiction. Very often, um, and we're, we have two anthropologists here now, so I feel kind of like we're taking over, so I'll talk that way. Uh, very often, um, in anthropology, we have a tendency in the past to kind of gloss over these contradictions and say, well, no, my job is to make sense of the culture. I see the contradiction, it doesn't make sense. But I think what we're seeing here is that noticing apparent contradictions can move us to a better understanding of the culture, the way in which people will respond differently in different contexts, maybe because uh, having to do with um, uh, shifts in like how sacred the space is, or another theme that came up 
uh, earlier uh, pain, you know, uh, the pain of the, the heritage of the struggle. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, you've done a really good job of dealing with contradiction without glossing it over, without trying to sort it out, make sense of it, um, or answer the questions for them, or even necessarily to say, hmm, these folks just thought a little bit more clearly, I'm sure they would say this, you know, the contradictions would settle into some unified idea. No, it's not like that. Um, what uh, do you think uh, would be your advice for ethnographers in general running into contradiction? How should we, as ethnographers, deal with contradictions? I mean, I think there's a simple and obvious answer to that question. Come up with more questions based on that contradiction. And it, if you do that, you're going to find more contradictions. Everything, you know, eventually brings up more problems for you. If you've watched Lost, you know, that every question <laughs> And it's the most frustrating thing sometimes, but once you get into it and make it your, your goal to ask questions. I think I told you once that I want to be a professional question asker someday, right? <laughs> um, that's, that's where it really go from. I mean, it's, it's not anthropology and like majoring in that. I'm, like, for me, this thesis is in professional question asking. And um, you know, so I think that when you come across these contradictions, when you come across problems, ask about it. And and I, I don't think you can be afraid to. All right, you know, sometimes we, we might be uh, afraid of this term contradiction. We might think of it as something like that. Somebody points out that you're contradicting yourself when you do this. You know, you talk about the importance of um, you know why women can't play drums in the tabernacle. But why is it okay for them to play this sacred object outside of the tabernacle? Well, you know, don't don't you know, don't be afraid to ask that question. I asked a lot of questions while I was down there, um, pointing out contradictions and doing it in a respectful way. And they were answered in in, in ways that, you know, they I could tell they were really struggling with it, but they didn't assume that I was attacking them. For example, on the Shepon talks about um, how, how Christ never died. He actually was just kind of in a coma for three days and then woke up. Priest Dermot Fagan, on the other hand, tells me right up front, anything that I tell you is the same thing that Shephon tells you. you know, he, he taught me everything I know. Well, then, no, Christ definitely died and rose on the <laughs> But he told me that, oh, well, sometimes we might have these like, slight differences, but okay. And basically, what I'm telling you is the same thing he's telling me. So, that's something I could dig, dig a little deeper on. That was kind of the very end of our discussion that day. So I didn't come away from that saying that they, they believe two totally different things. I came away from that saying that, you know, they're still working some things out. And that they have a different understanding maybe of, of what the text is saying. But in the end, it reveals that the important thing is that he wrote again. And not so much whether or not he actually died. And for Dermot, it was slightly more important, but, but the focus then is on the resurrection. And that's what has the application to, to our lives as people living on Earth today. Mm -hmm. And something to look forward to and something to, to live in. So um, that's how I have dealt with contradictions. Um, I also have to deal with time. I have a 32 minute video that I'm really proud of, and I know you've been sitting here for a long time already. But I'm not leaving without showing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta give a shout out to uh, my cousin Seth who helped me edit this thing, and then Doug Kretsch, Penn State class of am I allowed to say it? 2001. <laughs> All right, um, <laughs> film, film with you though. Uh, great. So he did a great job helping me make this look awesome, and here it is. <coughs> Oh, the king, the king, and I'm going to